This is MPB News. Hi, this is Karen Brown. Thanks for checking out the Mississippi Edition podcast. If you like what you hear, click subscribe, hit like, or leave us a comment if your app has that feature. Then find other MPB podcasts by searching MPB Think Radio on your favorite podcasting platform. Thanks. Good morning. It's 8.30 on Tuesday, January 19th. I'm Karen Brown, and this is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, as COVID-19 deaths climb following the holiday surge, state officials continue their push to make more coronavirus vaccines available to eligible residents. Then, with the inauguration of President-elect Joe Biden approaching, state capitals are under heightened security. We hear from state lawmakers on the insurrection in Washington and the challenge of working in a charged political climate. Plus, a new grant brings more humanities courses to Mississippi's prisons. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. State officials say they have improved the process for scheduling coronavirus vaccines amid a boom in demand from eligible recipients. Last week, Mississippians overwhelmed the state's scheduling apparatus, causing long delays and website crashes. Governor Tate Reeves says many of those problems have been addressed and says the recent surge in demand is resulting in Mississippi rising in the nation's performance metrics for vaccine distribution. We went in a relatively short period of time from being 50th out of 50 to scheduling every vaccine that we possibly can. Now, I know that a lot of people have had trouble with the website and have had trouble with the call center over the last week. And I'm, just like you, not happy about that. But I also realize that that is the nature of launching a product that so many people want. We can't get everyone their shots in the exact place that they want them at the exact time that they want them. We can get all of the shots that we have out as quickly as possible. And we can give as many people as possible a chance to get in line. And that is exactly what's happened. Tens of thousands of Mississippians were able to get through and get an appointment last week. And we're delivering those doses as quickly as we possibly can. Officials still acknowledge the demand for the shots outnumbers the state's supply of doses. Reeve says there will continue to be some limitations as the state moves to inoculate more residents in the coming weeks. I cannot promise zero wait for everybody, but I can say that there should be less of a wait for everyone. We are opening more locations and loading more appointments as we speak, including 1,200 doses at drive through sites in Hines County. Our partners in clinics, hospitals, and FQHCs will get an additional 5,800 doses this week. Those are first doses. In addition, there are currently 144 hospitals and private clinics that have approximately 50,000 doses that can put, be put in arms this week. Of those 50,000 doses, approximately half of them are first doses. Now, here are some of the remaining limits on our abilities going, for them, going forward, at least as I see them. We can give out as many vaccines as we're given, but we can't do more than that. I promise to do everything in my power to get every single dose out, But there are still more people who want a vaccine than there are doses available. So we do still need to recognize that and exercise some patience. To meet some of the demand from Mississippi's eligible population, Reeves says the state is shifting around some of its doses originally allocated for long-term care facilities, citing a miscalculation in the initial allotment. We have to be flexible and adapt as we learn more. And we have to be guided by data. I just got the information on every one of our partners that is distributing the vaccine on Friday. When I say partners, as you know, there are four different avenues of distribution here. There is the federal pharmacy program, which is doing long-term care facilities. There is, number two, 
the state-run clinics, which is a partnership between Mississippi State Department of Health, MEMA, and, of course, our wonderful men and women of the Mississippi National Guard. Number three is our hospital program. And then number four is our private clinics. There's approximately 147 on the list. When I got it on Friday, approximately 94 of them, almost two-thirds, had given out less than half of what they had been allocated. So just about 29 of them were actually above 65%. So we made the decision that this week we will only send additional vaccines to those providers who have given out at least 65% of their current doses. The vaccines that we don't send to sites that are falling behind can be used to support sites that are efficiently getting the vaccine out, whether it's our drive throughs or a hospital or a clinic. Let me be clear. I don't care as long as it gets done and as long as shots get in arms of Mississippians who want it and who need it. The demand comes as the state continues to feel the strain and loss following high transmission during the holiday season. The state is averaging over 40 deaths per day since the new year began, and hospitals continue to operate at capacity. State epidemiologist Dr. Paul Byers says Mississippians must still practice effective mitigation strategies. I would caution you with the three deaths. We've seen some low numbers of reported deaths over the weekends before, and we feel like that that's primarily a reporting issue. If you remember, um, last week we reported out 98 uh, deaths, one highest one-day total that we've had so far, um, and those were reports that we received uh, on the Monday after that weekend. So we are still seeing deaths in Mississippi. We are still seeing uh, numbers of cases in Mississippi. Um, we hope to see some moderation in, in both of those in the, in the coming several days. I think that there are some indicators that show uh, when you look at that that we may be on the verge of, of starting to see some declines in the state. Uh, I think a lot of that may have to do with us getting past the holidays, hopefully, and we'll see that we'll have a decline uh, in the number of cases and deaths. But remember, when we have a big surge in the number of cases, typically we will see – um, those deaths that occur uh, anywhere from 7 to 14 days um, after those increases in cases. So, you know, we're not out of the woods yet. We still need to do those things. In addition to broadening the availability of vaccine and getting as much vaccine out um, to our partners and through our uh, drive through clinics as possible, uh, we want to make sure that people still understand that they need to do those things that we've talked about State epidemiologist Dr. Paul Byers. Coming up, with the inauguration of President-elect Joe Biden approaching, state capitals are under heightened security. We hear from state lawmakers on the insurrection in Washington and the challenge of working in a charged political climate. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Hi, I'm Ryder Taff, Portfolio Manager at New Perspectives, a fee-only financial advisory and co-host of Money Talks. Each week, we take your personal finance questions and tell you about a money topic we hope you find helpful. Money Talks can be heard Tuesdays at 9 a.m. on MPB Think Radio. Podcasts can be found on our website, money.mpbonline.org, or on your smart device's podcasting platform. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. Tomorrow's presidential inauguration is being enveloped in unprecedented levels of security following the violent insurrection on Capitol Hill earlier this month. The FBI has urged officials at all 50 state capitals to be on heightened alert, citing threats they've uncovered following the January 6th riot. Some Mississippi state legislators say they feel confident law enforcement is prepared to handle any threats in Jackson this week. Republican Senator Dean Kirby is president pro tem. He tells our Desiree Fraser what happened in Washington was disappointing, but feels secure coming to the state capitol. First, it was a terrible thing that happened, and I hate that it happened and hope and pray it never happens again. Uh, I, was, I was a little disappointed in a lot of people during that. But um, what did I say? Only what I see on the news. I haven't talked to anyone up there about it. I don't know anything as far as the details, the background, what started it, who, uh, you know, who started it to begin with, who, who uh, actually organized that. I have no idea. I'm sure it'll all come out in the wash, though. 
Do you get a sense that it may have been instigated by President Donald Trump and the things that he had been saying? Well, I'm, you know, I think the I think the TV stations would very much like to blame everything on Trump. Uh, I do know that he did ask people to go home. I know that he asked that, you know, um, he, he tried to end it. Uh, whether or not he did quick enough, I don't know. Like I say, I don't know the background of it enough to, to comment one way or the other. Well, we have heard that lawmakers on Capitol Hill, some of them have received death threats. And there is concern across the country at state capitals. Your thoughts about here in Mississippi and any threats at the Capitol here? Well, we haven't had any threats that I'm aware of at the state capitol. Uh, we have really tightened or beefed up security. Uh, I, I guess if you were there last week, you noticed that there were a whole lot more police and patrol there, uh, along with uh, even canine units. Uh, we had the, the German shepherds walking up and down the halls as well. Uh, I think uh, what the governor, his comment was that we are ready if anything does happen and we'll be ready. And I think that's, um, uh, I think that's true. Uh, uh, we're on alert, I guess you could say, but hopefully nothing will happen. I, to my knowledge, we don't have any hard evidence saying anything's going to happen. Do you have you ever received death threats or do you know of any lawmaker at the Capitol that has? Well, I'm sure that a lot of lawmakers have in the years past. Several years ago, I know I had uh, my picture that was in the papers. A guy <laughs> sent me that picture with my eyes burnt out. It looks like by a cigarette or something and said, be careful. Well, of course, I turned that over to NBI. Uh, Did anything then, come of that? Uh, no. No, I, th I think they found out the guy was the Senate was pretty much harmless. Uh, and then, of course, my first term, I had a threat, just a simple letter that, that said uh, something like, um, be, uh, look under your car before cranking. That's all it said. So I think every lawmaker gets those. I don't think I'm any exception. And I haven't had any anything like that in years. Do those kind of things make you fearful? What does it do to your psyche going into the Capitol? <laughs> well, of course it would, you know, it would affect anyone. Uh, but then you just got to realize a lot of people like to do things like that. So uh, not a lot, but some people do. Uh, I think they make them happy to to think that somebody else may have to worry about something. So I, I don't know. Uh, but no, you just have to do your job. That's what you're elected to do is to go to the Capitol and do the best that you can do to represent your constituents. And that's what I try to do and not worry about those type of things. All right. Well, Senator Dean Kirby, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate you speaking with us and sharing your thoughts. Thank you. Democrat John Horn of Jackson also feels safe working on the Capitol grounds this week. But the Democrat from Jackson does say the outgoing president shoulders some of the blame for the heightened tensions and security threats. The chief executive of the United States uh, is who ushered the crowd on and, and stoked the crowd to encourage them to take the actions they took by storming the Capitol. And uh, I think that's uh, that's reprehensible on the part of our president to, that he would would um, uh, do that. And, and then he, he threw the rock and hit his hand. Uh, he would not um, take responsibility for uh, having incited this this riot and, and incited this insurrection against our our seat of government. And I, I really believe that um, he'll go down in history as one of the worst, if not the very worst, president that the United States has ever had. There are members of Congress who are saying they're getting death threats. They fear for their life. They're concerned about their families. On the state level, we're also hearing that there are plans to uh, maybe have protests at capitals. Do you see that happening in Mississippi? It was a quiet weekend. Do you anticipate any issues arising? In speaking with our Capitol Police, um, which is uh, Chief Don Boyington, who's done a great job, by the way, of preparing the Capitol for whatever might come. 
Uh, I understand that, that there are no credible threats uh, that have been received through Homeland Security at this time. Uh, Homeland uh, is providing uh, uh, regular briefings of them, I think the most recent of which was yesterday. Uh, and they are on heightened alert um, starting yesterday, going uh, beyond this coming Wednesday. Uh, we have the Highway Patrol that's on high alert. Their special ops uh, division uh, is on standby. Uh, they, along with, with um, other aspects of the, the Department of Public Safety, are, are um, well equipped and, and uh, they, they stand at the ready to respond to any, any problems that might pop up including uh, having uh, drone surveillance of the area so that they can, can keep an eye on things from a lot of different angles. We have National Guard units uh, that are on standby and that have been de deployed uh, and are, are sequestered in a safe place right now, but they can easily get to the Capitol uh, if there are any problems. Uh, so we feel that we're in pretty good shape and, and are prepared for whatever might come. As a lawmaker going into that building every day and doing so for years, have you ever been frightened? Are you fearful now? Uh, I'm not fearful right now of what may happen in Mississippi. Uh, I'm more fearful about other parts of the country. I, I think that um, uh, we've got things pretty well in hand. I, you've not really heard uh, about any credible threats, as I mentioned, um, uh, the um, Capitol Police has not gotten anything as a result of their briefings from Homeland Security, but you never know, uh, and you never know um, uh, what will set someone off. So, uh, as I said a few days ago to somebody else, uh, uh, being forewarned uh, is, is being forearmed, and we've been uh, forewarned, and uh, we certainly are forearmed. Senator John Horn, thank you so much for your time in speaking with us. Thank you, Judge Ray. The inauguration of the 46th president of the United States, Joe Biden, begins at 11 o'clock central tomorrow. Coming up, a new grant brings more humanities courses to Mississippi's prisons. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. If you ever miss one of our locally produced shows or want to simply hear it again, you can find what you need at mpbonline.org or download our podcast app to your smartphone. MPB programming is on your schedule at mpbonline.org. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. Three Mississippi community colleges are receiving funds through a recent grant to support humanities education in state prisons. The Mississippi Humanities Council says the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation's The Future of Higher Learning in Prison program will support humanities courses taught by Hines, Northeast Mississippi, and Mississippi Delta Community Colleges for the next two years as part of a new community college prison education consortium. Stuart Rockoff is executive director of the Mississippi Humanities Council. He says the grant allows the council to create a more substantial program for inmates seeking higher education opportunities. There have been uh, small individual programs around the state that have offered higher education courses in Mississippi prisons, but nothing uh, kind of systematic. And so our hope with applying for this grant was to help create a kind of sustained structure that, that will be able to offer various educational opportunities um, to students who are um, who are incarcerated. So our hope is that this is just the beginning of a much larger project. You've already started in some prisons uh, offering credit for credit courses, community college. Can you tell us about some of the specifics? Yes. So, so we have been funding um, uh, kind of humanities uh, education in Mississippi prisons for several years now. 
Uh, we have supported a program called the Prison to College Pipeline, which is run by two professors, one at Ole Miss and one at Mississippi College. But a couple years ago, we had the idea that we really wanted to try to expand those 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 offerings. And uh, working with our friends at the Mississippi Community College Board, we approached Heinz Community College and um, and sort of got them to work with us to sort of begin to offer Pines courses at Central Mississippi Correctional Facility in Pearl. Uh, that was about two years ago. And uh, so we've been funding courses there, and the hope always was to expand it. And we were very excited uh, about, actually about a year ago, we reached out to Mississippi Delta Community College about doing the same sort of thing at Parchment, and they were on board and excited, and then, of course, COVID hit, so it's delayed it. But, but so... So we've been funding these sorts of courses for a couple of years, and with the help of this grant, we can expand it to, to reach more students. Are you also going to expand the curriculum or stick with the humanities subjects? Well, so the, the grant is to support humanities courses. So that's English, history, and probably some other topics. Um, but our hope is that this will be part of a larger uh, array of options that the that will be offered by the community colleges. I mean, basically, each community college runs their own program, and we just help support them. But also, those types of subjects are requirements towards an associate's degree. Correct. Those are core requirements, and so our first priority is to offer those sort of core requirements, Comp 1, sort of in English, and some U.S. history courses. And the hope is that students who take these courses um, if they are released, they would then be able to sort of continue their education at any community college in Mississippi and work towards that associate's degree and even beyond. What's the response and the support you're getting from the various administrations of these prisons? Well, uh, very, very strong support. In fact, what's really amazing about this project is how many different institutions have come together to do this, both the Humanities Council and, of course, all the community colleges, but also the Department of Corrections. We have a great ally uh, with the Department of Corrections, and they see the benefit of these courses. They, you know, they see the value of them. In fact, they are, they are talking to us about possibly trying to even expand this program once it's fully up and running to, to some other prison facilities. And so we've had great Great, great support. What about from the students or potential students themselves? Well, it's amazing. You know, we've been funding these courses for a few years, and I had a chance to sit down and visit with some of the students um, about a year ago and to hear firsthand uh, how important these courses are to them, uh, to their sense of self, to their, you know, to they now see value in kind of, you know, in sort of their own worth. Uh, they have tremendous amount of pride in the work they've done and the education they're receiving and the sense that they are moving, you know, on a positive path for the future. And so sitting down with students and hearing firsthand how important these courses are to them uh, really inspired us to try to find some outside funding to help expand them. The grant comes from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and you applied for this grant specifically for this program? Yes. In fact, they usually don't have open calls for grants. Um, uh, Usually they invite you to apply, but they had an open call for the future of higher education in prisons, and we applied thinking it was a bit of a long shot since, you know, other states are much more advanced and are kind of cutting edge when it comes to these sorts of programs. But we thought they might be interested in really helping us establish this program of community college education in Mississippi prisons. And we were very excited to get the news in December that they had agreed to fund it. And so it's a two-year grant that's going to fully fund all of the instructor costs, all of books and supplies for the students, as well as some administrative costs to help grow this program. Here's hoping the pandemic ends soon and you can go full steam ahead. Absolutely. But I've been really pleased at how the Department of Corrections and the community colleges have figured out ways to do virtual learning, um, which is, you know, quite a challenge um, for these students simply because of lack of Internet access and, of course, lack of technology. Uh, But I think the 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 like real commitment on the part of um, um, of the prisons and of the community colleges to make this work. They figured out solutions. So that's been great. 
Stuart Rockoff is the executive director of the Mississippi Humanities Council. Congratulations on this grant, and thank you for being with us, Stuart. Karen, thank you so much. This has been Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Thanks for listening to the Mississippi Edition podcast from MPB News and MPB Think Radio. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. And if your app lets you, leave a comment or review. We really do appreciate it. Remember, you can always get in touch with MPB News on Facebook and Twitter. And fresh episodes of the podcast are posted every weekday morning. I'm Karen Brown. Thanks for listening.